teachers can be released. The children and the teachers can be released. Can't carry a tune. Well, good morning, church. That was really, I really enjoyed the table this morning, Ted, wherever you are. That was really, that was really good. That was very filling. And I know that's kind of different. You said that in, you know, most churches, they don't do it every week like this. And I love the fact that you offered that for people if they wanted to come up again. And I think that's just a picture of the gospel and God and Jesus that it's, do you want more? Because it's, it's available for you. It's here. It's, it's up to you. It's your option whether or not you want to take it. So uh, I love that. really appreciated that. Well, here we are in the midst of a, um, you'll see in a second, we're going to be starting a new series. And I don't know how long this series is, will, will go. Usually you try to have an idea. It's going to be a three-week you know, series. could be a five-week or a six-week and this one, we're actually going to be looking at a character uh, that, well, I haven't done a series on a character, a character study in some time. The last one I did that I really enjoyed was on the life of David. And that was a few years ago. Uh, I'm going to be doing one on the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. And he's a character like David that many people know. Many people, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, you're familiar with the story, right, of Joseph. Not New Testament Joseph, father of Jesus, Old Testament Joseph in the book of Genesis. And the title of our series here is the subtitle, When Life Doesn't Go Your Way. Anybody, like I know that's not for anybody in here. Life went exactly how you planned it. Am I correct? Life went exactly how you planned it. From the time that you were young and now you're sitting here and all of your dreams have been realized. No, some of you, I don't know why some of you are laughing because it's kind of, you know, kind of odd. That's my experience, so maybe that's not yours. So maybe there's a little disconnect in the room. But this is, uh, and, and that leads me into my opening for this. What is your picture, ready? What is your picture of the perfect family? Think about it for a second. Just take that. What is your picture of the perfect family? No, 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 stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Pastor Linda right here? Look at her. Look. Look at her response. <laughs> now, here is my, ready? This is idealistic, what I wrote down to be the perfect family. You get married to somebody. You, you were in a family, I should say, that you never experienced divorce. You never saw divorce. You marry someone that also never experienced divorce divorce. You two fall, you're madly in love. You get married and then you wait a few years. You travel a little bit. Life is good. And then you decide, you know what? It's, let's have some children, right? And I don't know how many children. That's up to you. Maybe you have two children or three, right? Depending again, that's your personal preference. And then you, the, your wife, if you're the guy, the wife gets pregnant. She puts her career on hold, and she stays home with the children. The father makes enough money so that she can stay home. And life is good. Covers all the expenses. Everything that's needed. She stays home. And she rears the kids. And those kids, they start, she has a couple of more kids. And those kids get older and they grow up. And they never fight with each other. They get along all the time. They do exactly what you tell them to do. Right? Right? There is no medical drama. There is no boyfriend-girlfriend drama. No fighting drama. No drama drama. There's just no drama. Everything is beautiful and everything goes well. And they get into the college or university of their choice. And they go there and it's graduation day and your dreams are realized. And... They're ready to go out into the real world, and then they meet somebody, and they get married, and then they have children one day, and then you're a grandparent, and you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table, and everybody's there, and again, nobody ever fights, and everybody loves each other.
Can anybody in the room relate to that? Is that your family? Because if it's your family, you're excommunicated from the church. <laughs> I'm serious, right? Right? No, we, listen, if that's you, I know we're not supposed to envy, but we envy you. If that's the family that you, and, and that's, that's great if that was your experience. But for many of us, that's not the experience of what family was like growing up. And we need to look at a family that is incredibly dysfunctional, all right? If you have a family that you feel is dysfunctional, <laughs> welcome to the Bible and church, because we'll talk about a family that's going to make your family look really normal right here today. And to start, I'm going to, and we're not, you know, you know what the problem is when, when you hear sermons about the life of Joseph? Can I be honest with you? And one of the st mistakes I have made over the years of preaching, I haven't preached Joseph in a long time, and God just kind of led me there, and I was praying about it and seeking and searching. And we're going to talk a lot about disappointment, I think, in this series. That's a topic I think many of us, that I think we need to hear it. And he's a perfect character for it. And the problem is, and the mistake that I've made as a preacher is, I've tried to do too much in, in one, you know, one week. I try to preach through the whole story of Joseph. And we try to go from the pit to the palace, which makes me want to throw up too. When I see you go online and so many series about the life of Joseph, that's the title that they have. Because I don't really like that. And we'll get to the reasons why I don't like that. But we try to do too much as preachers. I don't know. You have your own opinion, Pastor Linda, but that's just mine. So I feel like let's just take our time and let's ruminate on things. And why do I have to move so fast? And you're right. As somebody that's been a teacher for a long time. I love what you said, too, about when you hear things, right? You hear things, and you're passive listeners. You don't retain as much information. You know what you really learn the most? When you actually have to teach. When you teach the content, when you teach something, then you actually have to know it, and that's when you really learn it. And kids in school hate it because they just want to sit in a classroom, and they just want to be passively listening. Tell me the information. Tell me the information. They just kind of want to sit there like you do here today. Okay? But I get that's the way the system has been built. It wasn't the way. It, no, that's the way it wasn't. It was never supposed to be like this. It's not a criticism against you. It's just the system, the way it's been set up. So here we are. We're going to be in Genesis 37. Let me set the context, uh, historical context, cultural context, and then get into life application for us. That sound good? And give me a few minutes, and then I'll get to the really good stuff. So here we are, the life of Joseph, chapter 37. Let's just start with the first two verses here. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line, Joseph, a young man of 17. Do I have any 17-year-olds in the house today? Young man, how old are you? Are you close to 17? 15. You're close. Do I have any 17-year-olds in the house today? 17. So here he is. You can identify. Our boy Joey is 17 years old. Exactly where you're at. Dreams, ideas, things he wants to do. And he's 17. And he's tending the flocks with his brother. Do you want to be a shepherd? You didn't think about it? I I'm just asking. I don't know. Like, I don't know if that was part of, maybe a part of your story. That, all right. So he's tending flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Huh. So here we are, we see that Joseph's father, and again, I want to make sure, there may be people in the room that don't know the story well, that's okay. Jacob, his name means trickster. He is a manipulator. His name also means heel grabber. He is the guy when he is in his mother's womb, right? It's, he has a twin brother, Esau, and they're tussling even in their mother's womb. Esau comes out first. He's the older brother. But Jacob tricked their old father into giving him the brother's birthright because he was really the firstborn son. And then all this turmoil and all this family drama and there is Jacob. He becomes a man on the run. Man on the run. And there he is. Where does he run? He runs all the way to his uncle's house. His uncle's name is Laban. 
And there he is at his uncle's house, and he gets there, and his uncle has two daughters. Now, the Bible tells us that one is beautiful in form. She's gorgeous, and the other one has a great personality. And the one that he loves, her name is Rachel. I don't, do you ever, like, look at the, do you ever, like, read the story and really think about this? After he kissed her, the Bible tells us, what does Jacob do? He starts crying. What kind of kiss is that that could make a grown man cry? Pretty crazy, right? That's what the Bible tells us. It's in there. So here he is, and he has to, the, the, the father, Laban, his uncle, and I know this is kind of weird, right? Like the incestuous stuff and like sister wives and all this kind of stuff that you look at. It's in the Bible, and it, we'll, we'll talk about more in a second. But the father, Laban, makes him work seven years for Rachel. Oh, you want Rachel, my daughter, the hot daughter? You're going to have to work seven years to be here, right? The Bible doesn't call her hot, but she's hot. Right? So you're going to have to work seven years for her. And then after the seven years are up, he's excited. And then what happens? He pulls the father, pulls a fast one on the manipulator, on the trickster, and gives him, he doesn't know it until the day after, when he wakes up, it's not Rachel, but it's Leah, the sister that had a great personality. And then he has to work another seven years in order to get Rachel. The woman that he loves. And you have to see here in the story, you see, well, let's, uh, let's just get right into it with the dysfunction. He's got four wives. They have, he, ha he has 13 children, 12 boys, one girl with four different women. And right there, there would be a lot of dysfunction. Would you agree? A lot of drama. All right. And trying to figure out who's the mama of this one and that one. Come on, let's be real. 13 kids, four different women. Now, there's a TV show, Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Anybody into the Kardashians, right? Pastor Linda, it's her favorite show. Anybody else? You guys watch that show on TV, right? So the Kardashians, right? You talk about keeping up with the Kardashians. Try keeping up with, ja I don't know what Jacob, the, the Jacobs family, right? Try keeping up with these people. And Joseph. How much stuff is going on? Can I read you a couple of things that happen in the family? What, what the Bible says about the family to show you that reality TV, TV stations would have kicked them off because it was too crazy. Reuben, one of the sons, has relations with one of his dad's wives. Hmm. Joseph's brother, Judah, has relations with his daughter-in-law. Two of his brothers are mass murderers, Simeon and Levi. What were family holidays like? Hey, come on in. How's it going? How you doing? How's everybody? Oh, you killed that. You, oh, wait, you did, you, what? The, this is Joseph's family. This is reality. You can't just get into the story without really understanding the context. And you see here, Joseph is the son of the woman that Jacob loved, Rachel. He has, he, uh, she has two sons, but she dies giving birth to the second son. So that's why Joseph, when he's in his teenage years and he's 17, that's why he has God's, his dad's favor, because he is an extension of that love that he had for the woman that is now gone. Makes sense to you. All right. So if you've never been to church before, you have an idea now of what's going on. So another thing that you have to see in Hebrew, this is really, really interesting to me. When it says here in verse 2 uh, that he brings their father a bad report, and it's kind of easy to miss this. But in Hebrew, those two words, bad report, you know what it means? It means that he was actually lying to his father. This is a misrepresentation of who his brothers are. And I've heard preachers say this, and it's not really true. But when you look at the life of Joseph, Joseph is not perfect. You look at later, there's nothing later in the story that we can look at. But he is a young man that we're going to see as a spoiled brat. And he's going to, no, come on, he is. 
and he's going to get humbled. So here he is. He's a tattletale, first of all, so he kind of gets what's going to be coming to him. And he is giving his father false information about his brothers. Can you imagine how much his brothers didn't like him? He's, he's the favorite son. He's lying to his dad about whatever is happening with the sheep. Dad, I don't, he didn't do it. You know, they're not doing what they're supposed to do with the sheep. And whatever it is, he's lying to his father, giving them a misrepresentation. Now, here is the verse that everyone knows. And Joseph, the Technicolor, dream coat, blah, 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 right, Broadway. What? Megan said she could sing the whole thing. Now, part of me is interested to see if she really can sing the whole thing. But the other, other side of me is, I know you all don't want to hear her sing the whole thing. So after church, I'm going to tape it, and I want to see if you, can know, you know the whole thing. You really do? You know every song in the show? Every song? Why do you know every song? I know you like Broadway. The show's terrible. I fell asleep when I watched it. The show was awful. Listen to me. The show is awful. No, it's not. And every man, and no, I'm kidding. It depends who's playing in it. But the times I saw it, different places, I fell asleep. I saw it. Yeah, I did. You want to keep fighting right here in front of everybody? I'll keep it going. Anyway, you know. All right, here it is. Verse 3. Now, Israel, Jacob's name is changed by God to Israel. Love Joseph more than any of uh, uh, his sons. Now, y'all in here that have children, this is probably not a good idea to love one of your children and they know it more than the other ones. I think that's, is that parenting 101? Is that obvious or no? Do we not know that? So what did you think is going to happen, Jacob? That you love this kid more than the other kids? What do you think? Now, I must stop and tell you as a teacher, I teach a sociology class at school. I talk about birth order, and I love it. There's a day when I ask the kids, and I go around there, and I wish, there's a, I, I wish I had a camera so their parents could see, and I ask them that question. Do you? <laughs> Am I in trouble? Is that bad? I want to know. No, it is interesting. And I say, do you know who your parents, is it, do your parents have a favorite? And almost every kid in the room is like, very few will go, I can't tell. And I'm like, oh, that's great. But you'll have some kids go, yup, it's me. And then you'll have other kids go, it is certainly not me. <laughs> and it's interesting. I would love for, I would want, right? Now, I don't know what, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you do, what, what you tell your kids. My favorite child is the one that I'm in front of right at the moment. Right? And you, come on. You have times and seasons where you, um, you find children, one child maybe a little more difficult than the other ones if you have multiple kids. Am I correct? Or no? Or again, your fa I forgot. Your families are perfect, right? Your kids are perfect. So just mine. I'm the only one in the room in that situation. Pray for me. So here he is. His father gives him the coat, the robe of many colors, more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. Oh, that's nice, Jacob. What about the other kids? Nope, they don't get it. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. I underline hate because you're going to see it multiple times. The writer wants us to know, you see it time and time again, they hated him. They hated him. They hated him. Trying to convey to us, to make us understand What's going on in this relationship with the family? Now, here it is, the coat that they have, the robe that, that Jacob makes for him. I don't know how many of you have ever heard this before, but this is pretty cool, right? Did you know that the other boys had tunics, but theirs looked different than Joseph's in this way? It looked different in that their tunics would have been cut off at the shoulder, Joseph's tunic, Joseph's robe, has flowing sleeves. It's like flowing, and it looks so beautiful, right? It looks so nice. Here is what the writer is trying to tell us, and looking at the historical context, 
The father is saying to the other boys, you don't have a robe like him, and it's cut off at the shoulders, which means that you're going to be the ones that go out in the field and work. You're going to be a lower class, but here is Joseph, and he has the long Armani robe that you guys don't get. It would be akin to on Christmas morning. Oh gosh, this is going to be great. And your parents have presents for you. And your brother opens up a present. And it's, yeah, it's an Armani suit with a beautiful briefcase. And you open up your present. And it's a toolbox with wrenches and screwdrivers. And I don't know, whatever else is in there. That's what this is like. Didn't look at it that way before, right? See a little different picture now? No wonder they hate the brother. They, did, they were the ones that are doing all the hard work. And here is Joseph. And the father is saying, you don't have to get your hands dirty. They're getting calluses. And he's saying to them, come on, let's go to Nordstrom's. To Joseph. He's not saying that to the other brothers. You have to understand the context of a story. You have to, if, if you don't, it kind of, it takes away. So that's what he's saying here with the robe. Now, let's read the next couple of verses, and we're going to stop here for today. And I'm going to break this down. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, there it is again, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream. Guys, listen. They're having lucky charms, right? And they're sitting down at the breakfast table, and they're eating. And Joseph says, guys, 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 you have to listen to this. I had a dream, and here's what happened in the dream. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Can you pass me the milk? I mean, his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more. Right there. You have to see that. Stop. They hated him. Look, look. All the more. They already hated him before the story. Before the dream. Before he ever comes to him. There's probably incident after incident that this young, spoiled kid who has all the answers, tattles on them all the time. They don't like him. Uh, then he had another dream. Now, Joseph has low EQ. Let's throw that out there, too. You know what low EQ is? Have you ever talked to people before? They don't know how to read a room. They don't know how to read a social situation. And they say things sometimes, and you're like, did you really just say that? Did that really just happen here? Joseph, read the room, boy. Your brothers hate you. They despise you after the first dream. And then he says the next dream. What's wrong with him? Oh, Joey, you have a lot to learn. I had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. And listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. I want to throw up, right? His brothers don't want to listen to this. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him. This word in Hebrew is incredibly strong. His father is berating him. For saying this. We'll get to this in a second. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Foreshadowing. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. You know what's easy for us to miss here? Again, can I give us the cultural context? This is so radical and socially subversive. In the dream that he didn't ask for the dream. All right, make, make sure you understand this. He did not ask for God to give him the dream. Should he not have said the dream to his brothers? Is he emotionally immature? Yes. Does he have low EQ at 17? Yes. Does he need to be humbled? Yes. But he didn't ask for the dream here. This dream is socially subversive in that in that day... A child was to obey their parents. A younger person, the younger child, always deferred and looked up and respected and listened to their older siblings. You know why Jacob is so upset? 
Because he understands the culture, and he says, how could this young son of mine, even though I love him, this doesn't fit in with the social context, the culture of our day. This doesn't make any sense. And I tell you that because this, from this family, the Savior of the world would come from. God says, turn your systems upside down where you thought I was going to take the Savior from the family that looks perfect. No, I'm going to take him from a family that has all these problems, that has rape and incest and all these issues. That's where the Savior is going to come from because that's where I do my best work. Oh, I'm preaching now. Now I'm preaching. And I love it. He's, he's incredibly insensitive to, and, and so, you know, I don't know. Is he like, it's kind of, he's arrogant. He's condescending. He's a little bit cruel, right? When you think about the way he's saying these, these dreams to his brothers. So you get why Joseph needed a journal. Joey. Why don't you write down some of your thoughts in a journal? Have some music playing in the background, Joe. And take, take some of those thoughts and write them out. You wanted me to keep playing, my man. Seriously. He needed something. To, you know, sometimes God gives us dreams. I believe that God gives us dreams, church. And our dreams are not meant sometimes to be told to everybody. And it depends that if they're in the embryo state, it depends where that dream is on when we're supposed to tell other people. But so many times we can take the dreams that God has given us and tell them to everybody and we're not supposed to. Joseph, you were not supposed to tell everybody yet about your dream. But isn't it amazing that God lets this happen in his providence the invisible hand of God. God is not mentioned, by the way, in the book. God's not mentioned. He's not mentioned, right? God is with him. Yes, you'll see that. But explicitly, ah, here is Joseph, and he's here. And we have to see and understand what's happening in his life and how God has to humble him. And God says, even though you told them the dream, I am going to fulfill the dream, but it's going to happen in a way that you didn't see, a way that you didn't understand, a way that you can't comprehend. It's going to happen in my time. It's going to take a few decades for the dream to come to fruition. And they hated him all the more. They hated him. We don't like you. We don't want to hear you. We hate you. We don't like your robe. We don't want to see you. We don't care if you die. Now, you feel good about your kids? The fight that they had last week? What they said to each other? Pales in comparison to this family, right? You feeling pretty good about your family right now? You feeling good? All right, just making sure you're awake. Okay. There is no record. Now, here's, here's the part that I spent a lot of time on during the week. You ready for this? There is no record. And by the way, Joseph's story, I, I didn't realize this one commentator brought this to my attention. Almost a quarter of the book of Genesis is about Joseph. Almost. And I'm like, what? How's that? Like, yeah. It, now, in chapters 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. And this is what we don't get. Ready? Come on now. Stay with me. Nowhere in the story do we hear or see from Joseph where he says he remembered the dream that God gave him and he just pushed on through it. I'm going deep now. Ready? I'm going to go a little deep. You, up to this point, if you've been in church, you're going, I, I kind of heard a lot of this already. No, nah, not that. From this point on, let's just see. I don't know. Maybe you have, but this is just my take on it. Nowhere from this point on does it talk about it. Because you know what we do? You know what we tell our kids? And this is wrong. This is wrong. We tell our kids... Just follow your dreams. Just follow your dreams. Wherever they lead, just follow them. Come on, how many of you have at least said that? You said that. You told somebody, just follow your dreams. No, 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 no. That is not biblical. To tell somebody to follow their dreams is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is? The gospel of Jesus Christ is... You follow Jesus and your dreams follow you. 
Did you, I don't know, did you, did you guys all get that? Let me move over here and see, did you get that? The gospel of Jesus Christ is not go chase your dreams, reach for the highest star, and you can be anything you want. It's chase Jesus with everything within you, and your dreams are going to follow. You pull them along. I'm following Jesus, and this is where he's leading me. Oh, he's taking me down this road. I didn't expect to go here. When you put Jesus first in your life, kids, every young man and woman in this room, if you put Jesus first, your dreams are going to follow right behind. That's the gospel. Don't let people tell you just go follow your dreams. And I, that's why I can't stand when I, the pit to the palace. Go look online everywhere. I just did like a, you know, I, I took five minutes and I wanted to see how, there are a plep, there are tons of sermons about the life of Joseph and the title is from the pit to the palace. That that's how life just kind of goes. This is how your life's going to go. You, maybe you start up in the pit, but you're eventually going to make it to the palace. It's not reality. And the world in which we live in, the culture in which we live in, has done people a real disservice with all of this. You see, God gave him a dream. But the dream didn't look, when it actually happens, it looked nothing like it did when he gave it to him in the beginning. And that's a message that you need to get in your own life. It looked nothing at the end like he thought it was going to look in his life. Can I tell you, in you know, marriage, how about your marriage? Did you get at, go before God at an altar and you gave, you took your vows before God, before your family and friends? And you had certain expectations about what marriage was going to be like? Nobody told me how hard marriage was going to be. They tried to. I didn't listen. I had a picture of what marriage was going to be like. Don't get me wrong. I love marriage. I've learned so much. Living with somebody, getting to know them. I thought I knew them. I didn't know them. She thought she knew me. She really didn't. And the longer we go, almost 20 years, I look at marriage and go, it's the hardest thing ever. But you know what? I wouldn't change any of it. But I'm just saying at the end of the day, it's not the picture I had. I was at a restaurant. You have your own story. I was with my parents. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, at, I'm at a restaurant with my parents. I don't even know how old I am. I'm like early in my teaching career. And I said, you know, I had a dream. I don't have many dreams that I remember. Right? Some of you do and you have dreams every, I don't, it doesn't happen to me. So there I am. And I tell my parents, I said, you know, I had a dream. And we're at, uh, Megan, the, rest, the, the restaurant that you never went back to because the, the fingernail was in the food. Remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. No joke. We've never, Mike, never been back. There was a fingernail in the food. She said, I will never go back to that restaurant. And we have never been back. Right? But I had a dream. Listen, listen. I had a picture. And I was on a hill. And it was beautiful. And it's like, I don't know. The weather was beautiful. The birds were singing. And I was next to you. And I couldn't see. I was, I was older. Do you, I told you this. And I was older. And I was holding the hand of somebody. I didn't know who it was. I didn't know who she was. And I'm holding her hand, this woman. And there I am. And I'm thinking. And I'm looking back at my life. I'm going, oh my gosh, we did it. After all these years. But there was nothing that I looked back on in the dream. The dream didn't tell me that life was going to be hard. I was just standing on the hill. And it was good. And I felt great. And then I got married. And life just hit me in the face. The dream looked nothing like the reality in which I lived through. And I guarantee you, if I pass this mic around, you would probably all say the same thing. How about having kids? How about having kids? Come on, let's be real. Did every man in here, did you dream of having kids? Was it like, maybe for some of you, it was a dream. You dreamed of having, you couldn't wait to have kids. Okay? Couldn't wait. Anybody else? You love, you couldn't wait to have kids. Anybody else in here? Couldn't wait. No, no, no. Fathers. No, no, no. Mothers, all of you wanted to have kids. I'm not saying I didn't want to have kids. I didn't want to say, I, I, I'm not saying I didn't want to have kids. But how many of you realized once you had kids, the picture and the image of what you thought your kids were going to be like did not match up with what really was happening as they were getting a little bit older? How many of you understand where I'm coming from? 
I love my kids 50% of the time. I love them. And I know you do too. Come on. How many of you are going to be real? Don't, listen, don't, I'll pull this microphone. I'll go right up to all of you. We'll talk about all your kids right now. You know what? In the beginning, I can really tell you though, when I became a father, it was more duty in the beginning. It was duty. It wasn't really delight. I wanted to have kids, but then I got into it and you left me for the first time. I'm still scarred from this. You left me with Jameson, a colicky baby. I don't even know what it was. You were like, here you go. And you went out with your mom, and I sat there like this, and the kid was crying, and I didn't know what to, and I just kind of like walked around, and I'm like, where's the, where's the handbook? Is there a handbook that I'm supposed to, what do I do now? Because the bottle didn't work, burping the child didn't work. Where's the handbook? What do I, what do, I do next? God, help me. And silence. <laughs> She was not supposed to tell you that. That was your dream. In your dream that happened. But come on, how many of us would say, you know, I look at all this, the movies, you know what kills us? It's the movies and the songs. It's the movies that we watch that give us a false picture of what reality really is. It's every single marriage ends in, I mean, every single movie, the, the, the yeah, social media too, we'll get there. Every single movie that we watch the, these love stories, they all end in the marriage because nobody wants to see what comes after. Right? Nobody wants to see what happens after. Can I, can, wait, I, wait, I don't want the movie to end. I want to see what happens after. No, you're not allowed to see what happens after because then people won't like watch these movies. This is the image, the idealistic image of what we want to portray out there. Kids, it's the same thing. The songs that we hear, that we sing, everything is good, marriage is good, kids are good, everything, and it's not reality. The dream doesn't always work out the way that you got it from God. It's going to be in a different form. It's going to be in a different shape. The hamburger on the commercial, it looks different. The box looks different. Everything annoys me. Do you ever watch a commercial, a food commercial, and then you actually get the real thing? And you're like, it doesn't taste the way it looks. Come on. You get a box of a toy or something. It looks awesome. And then you open the box and there's 50,000 pieces and I don't want to put that together, and I can't. Megan, put this together. I can't do it. Jameson, help me. Help your father. You know what I was thinking of, too, that song? Megan, what's the, what's the Disney movie? I want to be shining. Moana. Moana. Yeah, you know that Moana movie? Yeah, that song has been in my head all week. Shiny with the crab, right? Because I'm thinking about this dream. No, listen, wait, I, I got a real point to this. Because I look at this story, and Joseph had the this, this stars in the sky. How, uh, what are stars? They're bright, right? You think about how bright these stars are in the dream. And then as Joseph walked up and saw the stars in front of him, they looked a lot duller. They didn't have the real shine. Wait, I thought it was going to be... But I thought this was going to happen, God. This is, but this is what I, you, you said you would do this. This was going to happen in my life. For us, how many people prophesied over us? We get married and it was great, right, and everything. And then nothing worked out the way we thought it would. Did it work out the way? I don't know. I think so. Right? I'm just talking reality. I'm throwing reality at you in the room today. Because that's what's going on here, I think, in the story. I could say more on that, but let, let's just move on. It's two decades before Joseph is going to make it to the palace. Two decades. He's going to get imprisoned, falsely imprisoned for a crime he doesn't commit. He's going to be working for the number two guy in all of Egypt. His name is Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. Her name is Hotifer, and she's going to hit on him. She's going to hit on him, and we're going to get to that part of the story, but he's, he's going to get all caught up in stuff. He's going to be misunderstood, and the dream that he had two decades prior, it's going to take a long time. And I know for us in the, the, the world that we live in, you know what we live in? We live in an Instagram world. We live in an Instagram world. Yo, what's up on the G, yo, the IG? What do you call it? The gram. That's what they call it. The kids call it the gram. I don't have an Instagram account. Megan does. I don't have one. I may have one. I don't use it if I do. I don't know. The older people, what do we use more? Facebook, I guess. That's what the young people, they use Snapchat, they use Instagram, use a little bit of Twitter, right? Maybe the older people use more Twitter. 
But we live in an Instagram, come on, we live in an Insta now culture. We live in a fast food eating, fed Xing, get in the fast lane of life. That's what we live in, and we want things done now. And you know what the problem is? We worship a dark room kind of God. What am I talking about? You know when you get pictures and you get them developed, when they, you'd go to a CVS, or you, I'm not talking about the prefabricated filters on your Instagram, right? And you take the picture and it's not the real thing. The filter that's on there makes somebody look better than they really are. I'm talking about when you had pictures taken and you had to get them developed and you brought them to a Walmart, a CVS, or wherever it is, those pictures had to go in a dark room. If somebody ever did a photo shoot for you, you didn't get the pictures right away. They took time. They had to go into the dark room. And that's exactly what the gospel is. God does his best work in the dark room. He does. What is, what is needed as the pictures are being developed and we hand the negatives? Can you hand the negatives over to God? Can you hand the negatives over to to God. Can you trust him and have the patience that God is going to work all things? Doesn't mean that all things are going to be good as you're going through them, but can you trust him with patience that he's a good God, that he's working things for your good in the dark room and he takes the negatives and he says, "It's going to take a little bit of time. I know you want them developed right now, but it's got to take another year or it's going to take five more years. It's not going to look how you thought it was." Joseph, it's not. Life's disappointments. You have an appointment with disappointment. Disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. That's how we come to know who God is. Do you want to sign up for the appointment for that? To get disappointed in life? Your kids are going to disappoint me, point you. Your spouse is going to disappoint you. Your, maybe your job is going to disappoint. Disappointment is part of life. It's what we do. And God says, I take you inside the dark room. And that's where I can do my work and change things and change you and mold you into what I need. I just love this story. The more I, I've read it like, I don't even know, 100 times this week. Just keep going through it and just kind of keep reading it over and over. You know what's easy for us too? It's easy for us as Christians to have 20-20 hindsight. Oh, I know how this story is going to end. Joseph didn't know how the story was going to end when he was in it. And can I say this? What if you are, ready? What if you are actually living the dream that God gave you right now? It's just that it doesn't look the way you thought it was going to look. Oh. How many of you? Maybe the dream that God gave you, you're actually living it right now. It's just not in the form that you thought it was going to be. I gave you the dream. It's just not how you thought it was going to look on how the box was. Can you give up the dream of what you thought life was going to look like and accept what I need to do and my plan for your life? Because I think at the end of the day, that's what we need. And what if, listen to me, what if your dream, what if it's just the, the, the first draft? What if it's a rough draft right now? Are you willing to let God make some revisions? Are you willing to let God change what is there right now in the story? And you think this is the final copy and God says, no, this is just the first draft. This is a rough copy. I have more things that I want to do. How many of us in here, as we start to come to a close and I land the plane, how many of us in here are willing to let go of the illusion of what we thought life was going to be like. Can you let go of the illusion? The illusion, it's not real, of what you thought your kids were going to be like, what your marriage was going to be like, where you were going to live, what was, your, your, was going to be in your bank account, and how successful you are. And I'm so sick of the culture in which we live in. We tell kids to look up to, look at, here's Elon Musk. You can be like Elon Musk. You can be like a Jeff Bezos, or you can be like whomever it is. 
that's not the dream that you're supposed to chase after. Those guys, who cares if you're just going to be a mom that stays home or you're a dad in a medial job that nobody else knows about. And you say, well, that's not my dream. I want to be somebody that everybody knows me. And God says, no, what if you're just going to be faithful and love me in the midst of where I put you in your life? Give up the dream. Give it up of what you thought life was going to be like, of what you thought life owed you. I feel that strong right now. I feel like the Spirit of God is saying right now, there are a lot of people in this room that you feel like, and me too, because I've been preaching to myself all week about how life was supposed to be. And it didn't work out the way you thought it would. Are you going to trust him and give that up, the picture of what you thought it was going to be like? Are you willing to do that, saints? Lord, Lord, I thank you for the story in the word. Lord, I thank you for the dreamer, Lord. I know so many of us in here, we feel like we're not living the dream. But Lord, what if this is the dream that you've given us? Can we just take one step in front of the other, Lord? Give us the grace be a light unto our path, a lamp unto our feet as we move forward, that we, we get into your word and we trust you and we give up the illusion of what we think life is supposed to be like, what, it was suppo what was supposed to happen. Lord, help us to follow you and then realize our dreams will follow right behind. Oh, Lord, you're, you're the one that gave Joseph this dream. You're the one that has given us dreams in this room. May we just follow hard after you in this series. Lord, may we, may we get more of you in the midst of looking at this man's life as we travel to a pit next week. A pit, a dark pit that has no water and no sustenance in there. And that's where you mold and shape and start to make this incredible man of God. Lord, give us the grace in the dark room. Give us the grace, Lord, to hand over the negatives and just say, we're going to trust you. This, I'm giving up my plan. I, this is what your plan is. I'm going to trust you, Lord. I can't see it's dark. And people in this room right now, it's dark in their lives. Lord, let them see the light. Let them feel your presence. Let them know that you're there. We come against the culture and the image and the picture of what they tell us is supposed to be perfect. We come against social media and all these things that are not true and they're not of you. May we put them in their proper perspective. May we see them for what they really are. Thank you, Lord. Amen.